a lot of a lot of the stuff in this really heavily informs Libra 418. Um, and you can look at this two ways when Crowley says that he's uh, that he's the reincarnation of Levy. I mean, obviously he studied Levy, so obviously he would be influenced by his works. Um, it's not it's not too huge of a stretch to say that this could have just come out of him having read Levy very carefully and you know, being highly invested in what he had to say. But um, it's also the parallels go to the point that it seems a little bit more than just um, a written influence. So as I said, I do tend to be critical of claims like this. However, in this case, I do think that it holds water. Um, another good example would be um, Crowley's take, or sorry, Levy's take on um, India, which he called, he has this whole sort of history where um, the children of Cain migrate there and migrate with the tribes, or, and meld with the tribes of Abraham. He identifies Shiva with um, Araman from Zoroastrian mythology, which is kind of a leap, but again, like most of Levy's um, anthropological or religious studies work is sort of um, very armchair. I don't know if he ever even left France at this point. Um, so he is speaking metaphorically, but also um, it's interesting that he introduces these ideas. It really wasn't popular in Levy's time to talk about the influence of Zoroastrian mythology on Christian dualism. Um, and just uh, to briefly break it down, in Zoroastrian mythology, there's a light god and a dark god, and they, they are at war with each other constantly. Um, which is not technically in Christianity, it's not technically in Judaism. God and Satan are not at war. Um, that's not supposed to be part of the system, but it became because of um, the Manichaeans who were an early Christian sect and had a lot of influence on the way things developed. Um, that, that idea sort of got stuck in there. And then it got picked up very strongly by um, Jonathan Edwards. Uh, who uh, was sort of the first revivalist preacher. He wrote a tract called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Uh, and he used to go around the States talking about this. Uh, he was the first fire and brimstone kind of guy, whereas that was not a, like, it's not a powerful image before. If you look at any references to hell in the Bible, they tend to talk about a state of being that a person is in while they're alive. And it refers more to this idea that I was talking about from Aquinas earlier, which is a distance from God not necessarily like a place that you go when you die. There's a couple of uh, passages in the Gospels that can be interpreted that way, but compared to all the times that hell is mentioned and hell is talked about, it's, it's negligible. It's pretty negligible. It wasn't really until Jonathan Edwards came along that people started seriously like um, embracing that idea and um, getting really into that idea of uh, hell as sort of an eternal punishment, which is kind of uh, important in terms of when we talk about the parody of a religion um, and the idea of a religion being used to control people. Um, as Levy says, oh, where did I put the quote? Where did I put the quote? I can't find it. Okay. Uh, basically what he says is that the, the laws of God are here to serve man. Man is not here to serve the laws of God. That these things, like, which is a pretty profound statement from someone who was I had nose hair away from becoming a priest. Um, and then this is kind of the thing when, the, oh, this is what I wanted to say earlier. Uh, the, the metaphor, my, my, the, my favorite metaphor for religion in this context of parody is a, like a hammer. You know, um, we can use a hammer for different things. A hammer is a tool. You can use a hammer to build a house. You can use a hammer also to cave someone's head in. Now, it's technically designed for building a house. That's real purpose, but it can just as easily be used to cater to someone's head in. It serves both purposes. Um, although that's not really what it's for. Uh, and this is sort of where we come into uh, Levy's ideas of virtue. Uh, at one point when he's talking about evocation and this whole idea of control of madness, he says there is nothing more to uh, <laughs> controlling demons than to do good and fear nothing. And that's, I find, to be a very interesting statement. And it's very true. It's, and and those, those two things, to do good and fear nothing, they're not easy. <laughs> it, it, you can just toss off that phrase. It's, it sounds real good, but in actuality, um, accomplishing that is incredibly difficult. Because first you have to understand what the idea of good is, and then 
fear and fear is not something that is so lightly tossed away, especially if someone's doing practical magic. I mean, as someone who has been doing ceremonial evocation, I've been doing ceremony, ceremony, ugh, ceremonial evocation now for since 1999, however many years that is. Um, and I like I still have experiences of fear. I still have experiences of difficulty. I'm still like I'm. You, you never get used to these things. It's just a matter of. Um, doing the yoga, having the concentration, and um, being able to use that technology without getting too wrapped up in it. Or, and also being able to like know how to respond to an experience of fear. Um, and this is kind of like where uh, the idea of religious devotion kind of comes in and becomes a useful thing. Um, it's not just, it's not necessarily about faith per se, but it's about having something to hold on to. Uh, at one point, uh, Levy says, um, man is a cripple and uh, walking on two crutches, which are science and religion. And there's definitely a, a point to that and something to be thought about with that. And it's, it's very true. I mean, if we don't have these things, we fall, basically. Have we any questions now? Um, what are the dates for the revival tree tree you mentioned? Oh, Jesus. Uh, I think he's in the 1700s. I, I wrote a deconstruction of his Sinners in the Hands of the Angry God. I can, I can email it to you if you want. Okay. I can find it. I was just, you were just, I, I guess it's academic, but you were saying first, and I was wondering he if was, they would, because Milton and, and uh, I, I, I don't consider, Dante and, and yeah, but they, I don't consider them to be like fire and brimstone preachers. They were, in a sense, writing religious satires and stuff like that. Right. It's but like, if, if you want to go if you want to go back, you get to like Joaquin Fiore in the 1200s and stuff like that, and he's talking about kind of apocalyptic stuff, um, but it's not in the same, this was a guy who would go around to, um, Jonathan Edwards would go around to like, you know, kind of poor communities, get a bunch of people mm -hmm. together who kind of didn't know anything and try to just terrify them. Okay. He, he wasn't like writing these tracts. Like he, he, Sinners in the Hands of the Angry God was his lecture. He didn't put it into a, a written form until much later. Okay. So it wasn't like a book that he did. He was, he was like literally just going around trying to scare people. If you, uh, I mean, Crowley writes Im scathing, scathing critiques of these kind of guys at the time. Because uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Billy Sunday or no. what he wrote about that. Um, this guy was like an ex-baseball player who was really big in the States. He was like the Pat Robertson of his day and age. This ex baseball player who come around and uh, just have all the, just do this revival of stuff. Like he'd tell all the women to put their knees together and then he'd scream, The gates of hell are closed! <laughs> and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that. That's the one that I remember, but he has a bunch of them. Crowley wrote quite a bit about him. And there's a, a, few other, um, a few other writers. Actually, one of my favorite fiction writer, P.G. Woodhouse, has sort of a send up of him as well. Oh, it's Billy Monday in his story, but yeah. It's kind of. It's amusing, amusing stuff. But um, yeah, uh, Jonathan Edwards was kind of like the guy who came up with the whole, let's go around and just terrify people, as opposed to like Milton is writing for someone who's like educated and right. knows what's going on and can appreciate literature and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah, that would be the distinction I would make there. Okay. Um, Yeah, I don't know, how are we doing for time here? In about an hour. I think it's good enough to do discussion time because I, uh, I get sick of listening to myself talk. So how old was um, Amicus Levi? He went into the priesthood in his earlier life and he um, got into, he was exposed to magic through a Rosicrucianism? Uh, we don't know exactly how he was exposed to magic. It was most likely because, as I said, um, priests were like selling favors and stuff like that. The, the whole thing was that if you were ordained as a Catholic priest, you could have the communion wafer. And that was considered to be a, a source of great magical power. Mm -hmm. um, even before the revolution, like, you would have aristocrats paying priests off to like do like destruction rituals on their aristocratic enemies by... Uh, Invoking the devil and burning the wafer and stuff like that. Like this was there was a huge current of Satanism and French Catholicism that was happening uh, for many years before that. And simply by because um, all the property was taken away and the ability to tithe was taken away, essentially the the uh, the French priesthood lost all its money. So you just had a huge upshot of this. So whoever could still afford to do stuff like that was doing stuff like that. So I imagine 
and especially, I mean, this was 20 years before uh, Levy was born, and I, he was pretty young. I think he was about, I think, look, he's was studying seminary, obviously, when he would be like, probably like 16, 17, I believe, if I have that correctly. Um, and I think that he left when he was like 20, 21. Again, I'm not, I'm not exactly ironclad sure on that. But um, yeah, like there would have been a lot of occult activity happening at the time just because the priesthood was in such dire straits oh. and they, they couldn't rely on their normal sources of income. So that's kind of what they would do. So within the priesthood. So how does that relate to um, Catherine Deshay and that group? Like, um, what was the progression of time? So all of this Levi was about, um, he was after this, right? Uh, he was, um, he was 65 and he died in 1870, so. Oh, okay, yeah. so, we, so yeah, it's quite a bit further. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is more like the Francis Dashwood sort of era, and yeah, like you, you and you know, you had a lot of uh, a lot of like problems with the priesthood, uh, and, and Levy's kind of interesting, and he's like the one of the few people like you can read people who are writing around his time that were really critical of the revolution, and you can read people who are really critical of the priesthood. He was kind of the only person who was critical of both of them. He's kind of like, they both suck. Which is why it's kind of interesting to see that, and part of the reason I think he was such an influence on Crowley, because Crowley was a lot like that as well. He was a huge social critic. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what brings me to like sort of my initial point when I was talking about, you know, in our culture, like we can't criticize democracy. Mm -hmm. It's not considered to be acceptable. But realistically speaking, look what it's doing. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of having a pretty negative effect. And that, that um, which is very strongly on the point of what I was saying about the, the great devils, how they're purpose and the purpose of evil in the world essentially is to suck meaning out of people's lives mm -hmm. because people are horrible when they don't have meaning in their lives. Uh, one of my favorite uh, quotes from Nietzsche is um, his Aquinas who came up with this outer darkness idea very famously said you know to, in order to be happy first you must be good and Nietzsche was like that's bullshit in order to be good first you must be happy <laughs> like happy people are great to be around they're nice to everyone they, they don't have to try to, like, it's so funny about when people use the word tolerance. So good to be tolerant. It's like, that's such a weird term because it's like, oh, yeah. You know, I saw Ed the other day. I totally tolerated him. I tolerated the hell out of that guy. <laughs> it's, it's sort of got a negative connotation to it already because the idea is you don't have to tolerate things that you like. You don't have to tolerate people that you like. That's not where it, you, to, you only have to tolerate things that you don't like. That's the, the underlying purpose. There's a kind of paradox with adversity, actually, as a concept, because, like, in certain ways, if you go through a lot of bad stuff, it helps a person build character, but then, like, people from um, poor families or have gone through a lot of stuff also turn to crime. So well, it's yeah, like, it, it sort of it sort of depends, I think. I think, like, it depends on the nature of the adversity and how people deal with it. I mean, how people deal with adversity is the ultimate judge of their character, right? Yeah. I mean, and I'm not going to uh, name this person specifically, but I... Let's just say that I'm, I'm close to this particular person who was always kind of like a bubblehead and kind of ditzy, kind of never, I never really could make a connection to. And they went through a pretty messy divorce and, uh, and there was custody issues and whatnot with the children. And after that, and the next time I talked to that person, they were fascinating to talk to. They were very interesting. They were like, they had their life together and everything, but it was like after having that experience, suddenly they gained something in terms of like knowing about the world and knowing about how to interact with other people. When Crowley um, had his initiation, like the way that the AA system works is like the second highest grade is Magus. And when he did the Libra 418 stuff that we were talking about before is where he got initiated into the grade before that or Master of the Temple. He talks about his initiation to the grade of Magus as being essentially like one of the hardest times of his life because he felt that to identify with everyone, he had to go through everything. So he had to experience, he extreme, experienced like extremes of wealth and poverty, extremes of, you know, like alienation, and then other, also being like in high society and stuff like that. Like it went right back and forth very severely. And he said that this was because he had to know what everyone was going through to be able to, you know, experience all human interactions.